Hi everyone, my name's Elizabeth, I'm a marine biologist and I am absolutely obsessed with rock pooling. So today I'm decorating a rock pooling birthday cake while answering your questions about rock pooling. How many more times in one sentence can I say rock pooling? Rock pooling! Mm. How many of you might have experienced an isolation birthday recently where your, your loved ones and your family and friends are not physically with you in person to celebrate. What does this mean? This means you get to eat your entire birthday cake and why not decorate it like a rock ball? So, as you're watching this video, if you want some inspiration to make a sea-themed birthday cake, then this is the video for you. But but I also put out there into the universe, what are your rock pooling questions? So today I'm also gonna be answering those. I'm gonna be answering the nitty gritty weird specific questions that have been gnawing at your minds and haven't been able to answer in any other videos. I'd get a cup of tea if I were you, because I'm gonna get a cup of tea and tea, cake and rock pooling sounds amazing. Before we carry on the video, I just wanna say, please subscribe and like this video. I'm a small YouTuber, it really helps me out. It helps tell YouTube to keep sharing the rock pooling cheer and uh, it would really mean a lot to me and uh, you don't want to miss out on more rock pooling marine biology awesome content especially um, as fingers crossed eventually when we can go out rock pooling again there will be a ton of actually rock pooling content that isn't cake that is real life animals. Okay so question number one from Hillary what's the one animal you found in a rock pool that you didn't expect to be there? Now I thought about this question for a while and I suppose the most unexpected I've ever been is a toss up between finding a nudibranch and finding a lobster but I suppose the one that I expected least to be there was the lobster which you can totally, well you can watch both videos um, I'll link it below and or link it up here as well. Um, a lot of screaming was involved. I was very excited over finding these two, but the lobster was really, really unexpected because I think I didn't know at the time that you can get them in rock pools. And it's definitely more common in, in Scotland. And this is one of the first times I'd rock pooled in Scotland. And finding like a fully grown lobster on the rocky shore it was big and giant and you know it's bright blue colour I was just so dumbfounded that this thing that I thought was like offshore and maybe if you were lucky you might find this tiny lobster like, I didn't really know that you could find lobsters in rock pools so that blew my mind whereas finding a sea slug a nudibranch I knew you could find them I just failed miserably for a long long time but then when you hear you say lobster people are like yeah they're in the sea so uh, nothing crazy unexpected. I haven't found any like things that really shouldn't be in a rock pool, in a rock pool yet. Question number two is from Tarbos6. Do birds and other terrestrial animals ever exploit low tide for hunting? Birds in particular do, and this is something that I didn't really know about until you kind of observe and see it. It's not something I've ever really been able to catch from film because birds like to stay farther away and I don't really have like a really zoomy video camera. But I've seen um, particularly at St Andrews, which is this little village and coastal bit, um, just like a 30 minute uh, bus ride away from me. Um, that shore in particular seems to be used by a lot of birds and the whole shore is kind of covered by herons which like way up on the cliffs or wait around for the tide to go out and then they all kind of descend and you'll just see like 12 or 13 herons that's very specific 12 or 13 you know what i mean that kind of range all on this quite close bit of rocky shore and they'll wait and stalk and i think they're looking for fish and other things to eat and I find that really comical that there's so many herons and I haven't really seen that anywhere else but I'm sure it happens in other places but I think maybe because the, the shores are quite small and there must be quite a large heron population for a small area it does look really comical and I've also seen like I, like crows so corvids are this group of animals of crows and ravens and they are really really super smart they are 
really highly intelligent. Like there was a video online, look it up, of um, crows picking up like snails, dropping them in the road where a crossing is, waiting for a car to smash them, waiting for the green light to go, and then walking out and eating the snail whilst the green light is on a crosswalk so that no one can walk across it. Crosswalk, again, that's American, isn't it? I don't think we call it crossing. Crosswalk, why does the camera bring out? Anyway, but it's amazing, it, it's really cool. And I've seen them do similar things with um, snails on the rocky shore. So they'll go and get lots of little snails and they kind of bring them back to this car park, which is opposite the famous golf course in St Andrews and they'll fly really high up and drop the snail on the hard tarmac and then eat the snail afterwards to break them up. And it's a really cool, weird observation. And um, so that's definitely two bird species that utilize it. I'm sure there is plenty and many more, but that is what in particular comes to mind and something you should watch out for. Let me know if there's any weird bird activity in your area and you've seen uh, terrestrial animals you know, utilising the rocky shore as well because uh, cause I want to know. Jess asks, is it true you can find amazing creatures like lumpfish and octopus in rock pools and have you ever seen them? Yes, you can find amazing creatures like lumpfish and octopuses in rock pools. Have I ever seen one? No. <laughs> I keep trying. <laughs> Lumpfish are a particularly awesome group of fish that I think look like pugs um, and like kind of that cute because they're really weird and ugly at the same time but also really cute. Um, but there are a, a rare find. I know you can find them on the Irish coast and I know you can find them up Orkney way. Um, I haven't ever found a live one and there will be many people I will be alerting if I do <laughs> in that exact moment um, that I do find one that would be really really awesome it would be really really cool I think they like kelp beds I've seen videos of them in kelp beds a lot more but potentially they're a bit more subtitle I don't know when I find one I will let you know and octopuses again I know people have found them. These are more common than uh, you would find lumpfish. You can find them pretty much throughout the UK. You just have to know where they are. I've heard of like rock pooling trips with the uni I was at. They went and, and they managed to find octopus. And it's just one of those typical things where like you're not on that specific trip and you miss out and that opportunity doesn't come around again because they're amazing at camouflage and they are quite rare and you know I don't suppose you're going to see an octopus unless it wants to be seen. I'm trying. I'm really, really trying. It was on my list to find one this year but um, it's not going quite to plan as I haven't been to the beach in a while. But maybe I'll be rewarded. Maybe after all of this when I finally get to a beach I'll just be greeted by what was a group of octopuses called? A wobble, a clan, a sophisticated meeting of octopuses, that's what I'm going to call them. I will be greeted by a sophisticated meeting of octopuses. I'm only doing that because they're really smart and I feel like they would be like, welcome back to the rocky shore. And I could shake each one of their tentacly hands. I really need to get back to the beach because <laughs> my imagination's going a bit, a bit, uh, Speaking of which, Beachcomber asks, if you could be on one beach rock pooling right now, which one would it be? I'm tempted with this question to go with an answer that would be like, I'd love to be rock pooling on like a beach in Australia because with the power of magic, I could zap all the way across the world and, you know, uh, explore some different uh, coastlines. I'm very tempted to say my favourite rock pooling spots in Wales, which will always stay close to my heart because I'd love to go back there to Rockpool but honestly right now in the current thoughts I just want to go to Arbroath Beach which is like a 30 minute train ride away. It's the beach I've Rockpooled on probably most and last year I went Rockpooling there so much I knew exactly what Rockpools had different species in and I mean it's a massive stretch of coast, it's really big, must be at least a mile long kind of thing and all full of rock pools and I knew exactly what rock pools to go to to find different creatures and I knew that if I couldn't find one I'd head back and find that rock pool that I knew I had it in like I had that shore memorized that's how often I went rock pooling and um, I 
I haven't been rock pulling there since October, or maybe a bit late October, yeah, late October. And it's just, it's just mildly heartbreaking. I mean, in the circumstances, you know, I'll get there when I get there. I'm happy to stay safe and, and do that, but um, yeah, I think that's probably just where I want to be. I just want to go to my local, my local digs and go back to the rock pools and hopefully still remember where all of the particularly great rock pools are because when you rock pool as much as I do yes you you get fussy with your rock pools and you get very specific taste for them <laughs> you know a good rocky shore from a bad one I, again why is that a thing but it is it is Each comment also asks what is the strangest thing you found in a rock pool for my uh one year posting on youtube every week video i went and did a special rock pool vlog at stonehaven and it was great you should watch the vlog loads of stuff happened we found loads of species we had all the weather it was this big thing and um really great day and right i had camera problems at all of it like it, it was like a whole year of rock pool in one trip it was kind of you know memorable very dramatic go watch that video um, and in that, close to the end, when I was kind of running out of camera battery, I lifted over a rock and found, I think it's, it's not, it's a scale worm, it's a, I should have googled this before, let me google it. I in a book, do I have a book? Yes. Let's see, a book close to hand, don't let that go. It is a, it's right there. It's a, it's a, it's a. It is a, oh, I don't have the common name for it. It's so weird, it doesn't have a common name. Well, look, it's one of these type of worms. <laughs> That's how weird it is. Um, and they're basically these worms with like, can you kind of see? I can't, I haven't got the screen thing. Of, of like circles like this, like there and there and there and there. And it makes up the worm. And it was see-through, except for the fact that you could almost see like, this ghostly circle outline. And I was like, that is not alive. That is not a thing. It, it's not a thing. And it was. And it was uh, a really cool new species welcome into the YouTube website. And it was, you know, one of those like last minute, oh, okay, I've only literally got like another three minutes of battery left, let me record. And found this weird worm that, you know, doesn't even have a common name. It just has Latin names for them. and. Uh, that was probably the, one of the weirdest things. Speaking of cameras, uh, this question is, what camera do you use and is it waterproof? I use uh, the Olympus TG5. It is an amazing camera. The great thing about it being good for rock pulling is that it has a really good macro mode, but it has to be really close. A lot of macro photography, you have to be like a meter apart from the animal to get really close in. I don't know how that science works, but it does. And, um, and this camera, you can literally be that far away and still get uh, a nice close-up image, which is great because you don't have that kind of range in a rock pool. Sometimes you don't even have that visibility. You have to record the species like right up close and personal, which in its own way is a skill to record like that because you kind of have to, you know, for every species I record, it's not like I'm seeing it and like jumping straight in. I'm making sure I don't scare them. You have to go in slow. You have to kind of let the rock pool get used to you. A lot of rock pulling creatures don't really care about um, you once you're there and you've not eaten them immediately. Uh, so it's a definitely a different style of video recording than maybe recording from further away. But this camera's great. It's drop proof, waterproof, shot proof, heat proof. If you lose it, um, you can go on their website and kind of track it as well and other people can hand it in because they're adventure cameras so i imagine there's a lot of people out there that have done some really awesome stuff and then been really gutted because right at the end they've dropped the camera or something so gets my full recommendations the olympus tg5 tough camera nelda asks what animals live in your waters here in the uk and can also live in ours in the usa that is an interesting question and a rather one of debate, maybe. So a lot of the species here in the UK could live in the USA, but there is a lot of work being put in by a lot of people to make sure that doesn't happen and reduce the amount of kind of transmission of the two, the two uh, 
you know, continents and the species they find. A lot of the species you will find that I imagine that the rocky shores in America look very similar to the rocky shores in the UK, kind of the same with Australia, but maybe it's a bit more uh, colourful in Australia. And um, so you'll still find crabs and barnacles and anemones and sea slugs and all of those different things, but there will be different types of those species. And when you kind of swap over, when say, uh, a good example, I suppose, is the common shore crab here. Common shore crab is super chill, it's on every shore, it's really simple, really easy, and it's not a problem whatsoever. But the common shore crab has now gone to Australia and the American coast and it's causing real problems over there because it's not used to it. That ecosystem isn't used to how that crab acts. Yes, you've got crabs over there, but they vary in their behaviour, they vary where they sit in the ecological niches. And the common shore crab has come over and, and isn't really doing great things for their ecosystem. So, yes, you can live over, species can live in both, but it should be stopped. And a lot of the species don't live in both. But then I did look up stuff like the barnacle, semi balanus balanoides, which is the most common barnacle here in the UK. You also find it on the east coast in uh, America. I keep calling it Australia, in America. Um, and... That, from what I googled, doesn't come up as invasive, but things like barnacles, I imagine, and there are a few species here in the UK, that they could, they were probably transferred from wherever they originated, way back when, on the bottom of ships, like, the earliest that they could possibly be transferred, they might have been, and when that happens, when we don't log the origin of a species, if it's been there for like, you know, say 150 years, then it's kind of maybe integrated into the environment um, but there are debates around that as to whether that counts or not as a native or an invasive uh, they're often called cryptogenic if they're under debate or if they don't know where it's come from yet but you will definitely find the same type of animals in australia america just not the same species of them and we shouldn't want them to swap at all. Talking of crabs, uh, Miles asks, any advice on founding brown crabs? A bit of specific I know. Don't worry, specific questions are the best. <laughs> um, I always find so many shore crabs that I want to go make bigger friends of big crabs instead of the wild ones in my lab. Yeah, I get what you mean. I totally understand uh, there is something great about seeing bugs in the wild. And yes, common shore crabs are so much more common um, I don't know if this is going to be a great answer to your question or a great help, but because rocky shores tend to be a juvenile nursery, I have only ever found an, uh, an edible crab, a brown crab, about that size on a rocky shore. And I mean, I've been reporting a lot. Um, I think that's just because that's, you know, rocky shores are their juvenile kind of nursery grounds, and when they get bigger, they go offshore to get bigger food because I'm sure you know that <laughs> brown crabs, edible crabs can get really big and it will be awesome to find one. Uh, the only experience I have of kind of finding bigger crabs is I suppose if you can get on a boat which is doing surveys offshore you might see them but from doing things like on land when I was fishing off of a pier once crabs are the bane of fishermen because they come along and eat the bait so often you reel in and realised that the thing you thought was a fish was actually just like four crabs where the hook is just eating away and then they'll just drop off and be like, see ya, thanks for the free meal. Um, but during that off of here, I have reeled in much bigger crabs, probably closer to that size on certain piers and certain places. Um, so maybe that's a way going onto a pier, going on something that gets you just that little bit further offshore and kind of doing some sort of like crabbing, maybe not even fully fishing, but just crabbing, uh, just putting a bit of bait down and see if they nibble on it and hold on long enough that when you reel in, you'll be able to find uh, and see a, uh, a lovely big crab friend. But good luck finding big crab friends and send me a picture if you do find one, because uh, it will be obviously a magnificent experience because crabs are just awesome and they're just so cool at any size. Okay, these questions are flowing right into themselves. Like, thank you everyone for answering such, you know, linkable questions, because this next one is a question from Richard Mills. I will let you work out from my answer to this question if you think that this person is related to me. 
do you ever worry about putting your hand into a rock pool and getting nipped? By crabs, I imagine. No, because my dad is a very amazing person which taught me from a very young age not to be scared of anything in the sea and fully encouraged me to reach my hand in and pull out as many crabs as I could from as many places. And that is what I spent my childhood doing. Now, they'll have to comment uh, underneath if this is true or not, but I'm pretty sure that my childhood went walking, talking, I don't know which way kids learn that round, but anyway, walking, talking, being able to hold a crab, learning how to cast a fishing rod. That was the four important characteristics of my childhood. It was really great to, I can't remember ever being scared of doing anything with the sea or reaching my hand in. Um, I mean, maybe it'd be different if I was in Australia because things can hurt you there. Uh, but there isn't really anything in the UK that can cause you a lot of harm, maybe in Scotland. If I see something that looks a bit like a lobster burrow, which is often like if you've got a ridge of stone and there's like a hole in it and you can kind of see that it's a bit clear, a bit like what you would see, almost like a, like a, a rabbit hole, but kind of almost like the Rocky Shore version. I probably wouldn't put my hand in because a lobster can do damage to your fingers if it's an adult size one. Uh, but apart from that, no. I will <laughs> reach my hand in and kind of pull and rummage anything out. Obviously be careful, don't go in there and just like tear everything up. But I grew up with a sandy shore, again loads of videos on the sandy shore beach and there's a lot of, which are here, there's a lot of tyres. So I would just kind of put my hand in and scrape out and pull out, you know, loads of crabs. My dad taught me from a very young age the safe way to hold a crab which is behind its claws so that it can't uh, pinch you but even if you do get pinched it doesn't hurt that much i've probably only ever been pinched like a couple of times i can't really even remember the last time it happened and i've held probably close to thousands of crabs in my life so <laughs> it's not something that uh, it should worry you and um just don't think twice about it and don't freak out that's the most important thing and it's a really important thing that my it, dad taught me from a young age as well don't freak out if you're gonna hold something, go for it. The worst thing that you can do is go to hold like a crab or something and freak out halfway in and by that time you're already standing up and you drop it and you know, for a small creature, dropping it right down to the floor isn't good. So you need to treat any animal that you're holding with respect. Only, I suppose, it's, it's great to see creatures up close, especially crabs, they're very durable, they are hardy, they've got the shell, you know, they can be handled, but don't go around purposefully, you know, holding everything, stressing everything out, but there are certain species, and especially crabs, that kind of can withstand it, and it is a great way, if you're curious about the ocean, and want to have a more hands-on experience, holding a crab is something that will stick with me forever, I still get excited as an adult, and it's a great way to kind of show kids um, exactly what the sea is about. So yes, Richard Mills, I'm not scared of holding crabs. Shout out to my dad. Whoop, whoop. Another question about crabs, it's because they're awesome, and I go on about them a lot, from Jess is, where is the best place to find a velvet swimming crab and other cool species? Oh, velvet swimming crabs. I haven't found one of these in years, and I'm so sad because it is my absolute favourite animal I think. I know I got about barnacles and barnacles are my favourite group of animal. I love a barnacle but my favourite individual species is uh, a velvet swimming crab. See I even have a crab ring. There's a lot of, I love crabs so much but these are just aggressive and evil and, and oh I don't have any good videos of them because the last time I saw them I didn't even have like a proper camera to take a picture of them with or a smartphone to take a picture of them with. That's how long ago it was. The best place I have found them is if you're in Wales, Pembrokeshire and um, the Gower coastline, particularly Bracelet Bay if you're near Swansea, there's Mumble's Head and then it goes into this little bay next to it called Bracelet Bay. I found like devil crabs this big which are mental mad, but that's really big, really aggressive and really awesome. And it's also the first time I ever found that crab or found out it existed, so Bracelet Bay so I'm going to combine two questions together for this one. Uh, it said, saw this 
on the 19th of February on the Isle of Wight and I think it's a nudibranch as I've seen many aboard when diving but what species do we get around here and the question what are the nudibranchs that you can find in Scotland rock pooling so to the Isle of Wight mystery nudibranch it is sand isn't a nudibranch it is a sea hidden sea slug it looks like a sea slug it's in fact a sea hare which isn't a true nudibranch because it has a very sneaky shell in its body but it is a sea hare they're really awesome and they are really weird i have a whole video about the weird weird animals that they are in fact they are probably one of the weirdest animals in the entire ocean not just rocky shore the entire ocean so go check that out video because i don't want to spoil the rest of it because you really need the whole video to take in just man i don't know what was going on there when they evolved but really cool um but because they have this kind of sneaky hidden shell within them they're not true sea slugs but they are really awesome finds and because they're much bigger size they can get up to like hand size at least if not two um then they're one of the ones that you find a lot more often on on the shore than you do the teeny weeny little nudibranchs now the rest of it the nudibranchs you find in scotland i am no expert on nudibranchs i've tried to find them for years i've only found one you can watch that video again you can imagine after years of trying to find a species and then happening when you're not even looking for one on it how crazy i went worth a watch just for the insane reaction i had but anyway um the person who is i suppose can we call her the nudibranch queen she's amazing she knows all the nudibranchs in the uk um it's heather Bouvion. yeah she is great in fact i'm going to put in some art now i listened to her lecture series on nudibranchs and was amazed by the sheer number that you can find and asked her the exact same question of what can you find in scotland and a lot of the same you just have to kind of get your eye in so showing you this page shows you just how many you can find so my recommendation to you is to not look for a specific species or to work out what it is but to first try and get your eye in to even find them you are looking for species on uh, low tide under rocks in places that are always in water because they can't really cope being out of water for very long uh, you can also find them on different levels of the shore but you're most likely to find them lower down the beach looking on things like um seaweeds particular seaweeds they like to eat and hydroids which look like little bit white of fluff and the best way to find them um is to look when they're still in water so if you lift up a rock and look at it you're not going to really see them because they'll just turn into a really squidgy blob that yeah that kind of looks like you've sneezed and uh you'll just think yeah but put them in the water and they all their frills and all the identifiable features kind of pop back out and they're super delicate so that's what you're looking for so in scotland you can find a load of nudibranchs don't give up keep trying i definitely am or will when i can and um yeah a lot but they're just really really tough to spot so good what's the question what is my favorite find in a rock pool to date all the nudie rank and the lobster coming to mind again but i will pick something else because I feel like i say that all the time and there are plenty of other species that i found that are really awesome i found a tortoise shell limpet that is pretty cool it's not something you really find elsewhere or i haven't anyway it's particularly like a scottish and particularly great east coast thing um, and it's a limpet shell that just looks like a tortoise shell. It's great. It's that like, you know, that tortoise shell pattern on a limpet. And I love tortoises and I love limpets. So finding those together was really cool. And I kind of forgot they existed until I found a limpet and went, oh, that looks just like a, to like a tortoise. And I was like, remember that from a book somewhere ages ago. Oh my God, you can find them. And uh, yeah, that was probably a pretty cool find. I really liked that one. That was really ace. Any devil crab I ever find. I always love that. Volcano barnacles, they're really cool. I've seen them on the Welsh coast. They're like really pointy barnacles and they're kind of like purpley and they look like a mini volcano. There are also species of barnacle called Jephalamus. 
again matte and struggles with outside and they've got like an iridescent blue stripe on them but again something i found in wales which i have a camera um that's really cool find too to find a sparkly blue barnacle amazing right one a final question one final question from laura what can you expect to see in winter time if one is brave enough i mean yes oh, i know what you mean <laughs> from my experience rock crawling in winter um you will find a lot less fish or a lot less tiny fish the breeding season of fish kind of st starts mainly in like april goes through summer you'll find lots in fact in some bit times in summer you'll just look and there'll be thousands of fish probably hundreds of thousands of fish across the whole shore there's so many of these tiny little baby fish but by the time winter's come either they've grown up and swum off to sea or they have got eaten by other things so you won't find really any small fish and that's quite noticeable that as you walk around a rock pool there's no more like little darting or little movements that kind of catch the corner of your eye that's very much gone in winter um seaweeds die back not all seaweeds some seaweeds live out its winter years but they're especially the smaller ones um, and the more colorful ones that's probably not scientific but just from observation um they grow they kind of either they disappear and come back um in the springtime or they uh go really small so that you can't see them as much and just kind of survive on the bare minimum until spring and summer comes around again and they can bloom back into their amazing uh, bigger selves I feel really self-conscious talking about seaweeds when the question that Laura asked is just like she's like a seaweed expert so Sorry if that's wrong, but that's what I thought was right. <laughs> you still find things like snails and hermit crabs and crabs, but just in less number, mainly because some of them might not have made it. Um, they're not quite as active because it's a bit, you know, uh, a, a bit colder, a bit, you know, lots of things are hunkered down rather than running about and enjoying the lovely sun and water. Uh, it's probably not. <laughs> Again, not quite scientific explanations, but you get the gist. Um, and also they're not breeding, so a lot of crabs will come together to breed. And so in spring and summer you'll find them kind of congregated together. In winter, that's not the case. They don't need to be close to each other. They kind of stare out of each other's way, so you will find less. There are still loads to be found. In fact, sometimes it's a lot easier to find stuff in winter because the species that are still around, it's very obvious that they're there. They're not distracted by other things. Um, and some of the best times to find stuff is just before spring when there are a few really awesome creatures that come out just at the end of winter just before the mass spring rush and you can get some really good footage and really good filming of like a few individual species some of the juvenile fish come out a bit earlier things like pipefish tend to be there maybe like a week or two before everything else just from again my personal experience so you can get really good things of things like pipefish and butterfish early and then they disappear as the rest of the species come out so if you want to go rock pooling and avoid you know the freezing cold but still want to catch some species like february march time is really good to catch some really good species that you can just see because they're so obvious because nothing else is there yet <laughs> but things like limpets barnacles bryozoans in fact some bryozoans love winter because that's when they breed and they do their thing um you still find sponges and seaweeds and you can probably still find nudibranchs but i've only ever found one of them so i don't I can't really count it still find all your crabs your crustaceans your chitons all the things that look hardy and look like they're not going to move will stay there and live out winter um it's just the mobile stuff that can actually choose to go somewhere different um and being offshore sometimes helps in winter because the seas are so stormy and so rough that the rocky shore gets a battering and being offshore, not where you're gonna get as many rocks lobbed at you and waves physically crashing on you. It's just easier for a lot of species. So their whole summer is geared up to getting ready at the end of autumn to go offshore to make sure that they're not there for the terror that is coastlines in winter in the UK. <laughs> so 
that was my Q&A video. I hope you found it interesting. Make sure to comment on the bottom of here any more questions you have. I will be doing another Q&A session in the future and I'll make sure to come back and look at this. And if we get enough, I will do one earlier. I will do one sooner. So make sure you comment below any more questions you have, whether it be things about what I have found, things you found, a whole range of stuff. Go ahead and do it. It'd be great. Just comment below. I hope you enjoyed the rock pulling cake. I really, really enjoyed it. There are benefits to having birthday in isolation because no one wants a slice of the cake too. Hello everybody that's not in my flat with me. Do you want a slice of cake? No? Fine. Again, like, subscribe, please. Uh, just because I'm a small YouTuber and that really helps tell YouTube to help spread rock pulling cheer and who wouldn't want to spread rock pulling cheer? I hope you have a fab week. I'll be back next Wednesday with another video for you guys like I do every single Wednesday. Bye everyone.